Hi, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You're listening to Living the Wildlife, discussing all things related to vertebrate pest control as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast for Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad to have you on board. I hope your week went well. Um, I'm uh, doing a lot of recording, doing some recording today, so I'm really glad to have uh, Eric Wolf of Ovo Control uh, with us today. But before we get to him, just a reminder, I do ring the bell and subscribe to the channel. Do tell us if we're what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. You can reach me at Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com. Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com. Thoughts, comments, yes, even criticisms, you can get out, uh, send that out to me. I would like to hear from it. Uh, today we have a guest. Uh, Eric Wolf is the CEO of Inalytics LLC. He is the uh, sort of, I guess, founder of this particular company that started in 2003. And this is birth control for pigeons. So if you're wanting a non-lethal method of controlling pigeons, and maybe some of your clients are interested in that, he's going to talk about this particular birth control product for pigeons. And you can learn more, of course, at ovocontrol.com. And we're going to go kind of do a deep dive into this particular product that can help people resolve some of their problems with pigeons according to their ethical standards. Uh, Mr. Wolf, thank you. glad to have you on board here on uh, Living the Wildlife. Thank you, Steve. And I appreciate so, the introduction. So tell us a little bit about yourself. How what got you into starting this company with analytics? Well, there was uh, the uh, the active ingredient we work with is something called nicarbazin, and it has a long history, uh, going back uh, sixty five years or so. Uh, it was originally developed by Merck, uh, the pharmaceutical oh. company, okay. uh, for use in chickens. And it's use in, and so it goes back 19, early 1950s, 1953, I believe it was originally put on the market. And it was back in, a, back in the day, Stephen, where um, chickens were, you know, you didn't buy chicken at Costco or, or Ralph's or Bonds or Albertsons, or anything like that. Uh, chicken came from the farm right. and it was a Sunday meal. It wasn't an everyday meal. It was oh. a special meal. Okay. The farmer went around the back and and got himself a, a an old egg layer, right. uh, and and uh, 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 took its head off and threw it in, threw it in a pot for a day of cooking to get it uh, to get it uh, tender enough to eat. So uh, clearly uh, times changed, and, right. and uh, the vertical integration of the poultry industry is well known, um, and. That vertical integration uh, took a number of steps, number of milestones and innovations along the way that made it possible to grow 10,000 chickens in a chicken house in a matter of 35 days. Mm. So that's all the longer it takes to grow a chicken from day old chick to uh, uh, to adult chicken that goes, you know, two and a half uh, what is it? Two and a half kilos, something like that. Okay. And, it, and it goes to the chicken house or so, chicken slaughter plant. About six and, pounds, then, right? There yeah. About six, seven it, pounds. Live weight. Correct. Yeah. And uh, it takes all of, you know, it takes a very short time, just like That's pigeons. Amazing. They yeah. grow very quickly as well. You know, it seems like they fledge over the weekend. Um, at any rate, so along the way, there were certain innovations and this active ingredient night carbazin was one of those uh back in the day if you put too many chickens together they would all get a, a disease called coccidiosis uh, so coccidiosis is an enteric disease it uh, uh, uh affects the digestive system and if 
if left uncontrolled, you know, you can lose half your chickens overnight. Mm. Uh, they get bloody diarrhea and then you got a bunch of dead chickens. It is it, the chickens are most sensitive when they're young. And uh, if you're if you're in animal husbandry, you know coccidiosis because any animal that eats from the ground is subject to coccidiosis, this infection of coccidia. It's a parasite, um, okay. uh, and infects the uh, inside of of uh, the digestive tract. And uh, sheep get it. Dogs get it, pigs get it, uh, you know, literally anything can get it that eats from the ground. Even your kids can get it. You know, they go in a sandbox and eat uh, protozoa uh, and they end up with a protozoal infection called coccidiosis. Okay. And this thing was prior to the innovations like nicarbazin. Um, there was no stop in this. There was, you know, there was nothing to prevent the disease. And uh, this was uh, the innovation by Merck uh, back 65 years ago uh, was one of many. And today, if you look on the market, there are an entire array of what are called coccidiostats, uh, drugs that prevent uh, or control coccidial infections in, in chickens. Interesting to note that nicarbazin is still used by the carload in the world of uh, uh, industrial chicken production. So if you eat chicken, rest assured that your chicken has probably seen some nicarbazin during its lifetime. No kidding. Uh, I mean, it is it the uh, uh, um, the material is in literally all the poultry integrators across you as, as you know it's a very short list of of tyson purdue um foster farms uh who else is there back on the uh, southeastern coast and and uh um yeah, the different... tyson, yeah tyson's the big one there was no doubt tyson, about that tyson's yeah. very obviously very okay. large but there are others that are that are large as well. I believe there's about seven of them. Okay. At any rate, they all use nicarbazin to prevent the uh, 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 coccidial disease in their chickens. Now, early on, when this stuff was being uh, first got wider and wider use, there was no industry per se. So the the uh, concept of large scale chicken production didn't really exist. You couldn't do it. Uh, you know, and then along came these kinds of products as well as vaccines and other technologies that allowed uh, the producer to put together uh, a lot of chickens in the same place. One of the one of the effects, the side effects of nicarbazin in chickens was that if fed to broiler breeders, these are the chickens that lay the eggs that become the day-old chicks that you make broilers out of. But it's a separate population. They're called breeders. And uh, as the name implies, they just breed. They lay eggs every day, just like an egg-laying chicken would, but they're fertilized. So these the breeders are kept together with, with roosters, and uh, uh, they make the day-old chicks. And, of course... Over time, another innovation, technology, technological innovation was genetics. So the chickens are bred for this ability to, to uh, transform uh, a pound and 1.7 pounds of feed into a pound of meat. Uh, so they're in, in incredible, incredibly efficient converters of feed uh, to meat. Uh, so not only do they grow fast, they grow very efficiently. And genetics plays the largest role in that uh, uh, in that conversion. Mm -hmm. uh, but they learned early on, Steve, that if you if you get this drug into the broiler breeder feed, into the breeder ration, all of a sudden the eggs will stop hatching. <laughs> so right. you, you feed it to them. In error, 
Right. And of course, back in the day, it was much easier to do errors than it is today. Today, they have separate <laughs> mills that right. are dedicated to breeder feed. And nothing else goes into that, in or out of that particular plant, you know, with the exception of the, the trucks that supply the breeder houses with feed and that kind of thing. So they've eliminated much of the errors that happen, misfeedings. Right. Uh, but you can get you can get an effect with nicarbazin just through cross contamination, and that back in the day, you know, when feed mills were making everything from horse feed, cattle feed, chicken feed, dairy feed, you know, you'd have one lot, one batch after another going through there. And you had quite a lot of cross contamination. So you make a a, a broiler feed, uh, and then you follow it with a breeder feed. And if you had nicarbazin in the uh, uh, in the broiler feed, you'd end up with some cross con contamination. And as as so, it didn't take very much to to stop that refertility. So I'm I'm assuming there would be. So we're talking about probably even micro doses. That yeah, would it's cause it's, it's parts per million. Parts per million. Okay. okay so the the um, um, what is it called? The it, it, it's the level of sensitivity Effect. or something okay. like that. It is down at ten parts per million. So oh, get wow. if you're above ten parts per million, you're going to have an effect. If you're below ten parts per million, you're probably not going to have an effect. Okay. Um, so the the chicken people, of course do whatever they possibly can to avoid any cross-contamination or misfeedings or anything. Invariably, at least once a year, uh, somebody will come along and say, oops, uh, you know, we got some, <laughs> we got some nicarbas in, in the breeder feed. You know, they, they'll, they'll look in their incubators and they'll open them up. And, and instead of hearing peep, 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 they hear nothing. 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 So it is, if you get, if you get a full dose, you know, not 10 ppm, but if you get a full dose of 125 ppm nicarbazin into a breeder ration, nothing is hatching anymore. Right. I mean, it just it just turns off uh, uh, the fertility of those eggs. And uh, um, so for 65 years or so, the Merck salesman would run around the countryside and tell all the poultry integrators, great product to use for chickens, but whatever you do, don't, don't get, get it, in it into your breeder feed. So, so who, who decided to test it on pigeons? Uh, that was us. Well, that was you. <laughs> so what gave you the idea to thought, well, let's try this Steve, on pigeons? It, it, I, we are not the first people okay. to, to ever think of this idea. All right. Uh, it it it's been around for sixty five years. Okay. People thought, wow, you know, this would be a, this would be a pretty interesting idea to control pest birds, non lethal way of you know instead of using a toxicant, right. let's use this and stop them from breeding and just run the population down through attrition. Hmm. Well, they invariably everybody that thought of that idea ran into significant problems. Uh, they couldn't get it to work. Um, so you would think something that you fed with a chicken and you had this kind of profound effect in a chicken that you'd have the same profound effect in a in a starling or a pigeon. And it, right. sorry, it's it's just not true. Uh, so it was tried by multiple investigators over the years. And, you know, I can dig out the citations for you. Right. Um, there was a guy that uh, ran probe studies at uh, uh, University of Missouri. There was a guy in, at the University of Jerusalem that ran studies. The, the Italians ran studies. Uh, uh, a bunch of different people. And they, they, they all came to the same conclusion. No effect. And what was the problem? Well, well I wouldn't uh, affect on pigeons. He, my 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 partner, who's a who's a chemist, uh, uh, an organic chemist, and he spent most of his career at at, uh, at Roche Labs. Mm -hmm. He said, "This is impossible. You know, you can't have this kind of profound effect in chickens and not have it in other species." 
the the issue must be that they're not absorbing it. So we oh, took okay. we took a different tact on formulation. What they did in the past was just use uh, nitrobenzene, either technical grade nitrobenzene, hundred percent, or uh, a premix. The commercial premix that sold in the poultry industry is twenty five percent. And you, it, to get the right dose, you add a pound per ton of feed. It's right. as easy as that. Um, but my partner indicated that he just didn't believe this. And so he started fiddling with the with the formulation and how to get it into uh, uh, into pigeons. And well, we, we didn't actually start with pigeons. We started with geese. Okay. Uh, we started with Canada geese was our first development and the reason we started with geese is that there was so much support for it at the time yeah. from uh usda from uh, uh u.s fish and wildlife from the different uh animal welfare groups they all thought that you know this was the uh this was the what do they call it the golden uh golden grail uh, yeah, holy grail. Yeah, holy the grail. silver bullet. Yeah, of of wildlife control, and um, we you know we went through the development phase and and eventually got a product and we brought it to EPA, uh, who had never uh, registered or even uh, maybe they did review something previously that 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 sterilized animals, but this was the first time they looked at one that contracepted uh, mm. a wildlife species and it was canada you know canada goose okay and while all these organizations starting out started out very supportive over time they <laughs> they grew less less supportive uh the the uh, um, and we have a we have a publication on it i can send you but it, 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 it's called the uh, political and social barriers uh, to entry for wildlife contraception or something. Is that, like that. the vertebrate pest conference proceedings? Uh, it is. Yes, it, it should be in there. It, it's also published in uh, zoo, zoo veterinary. Oh, OK. Yeah. I can I can send you copies. No problem. Um, but it describes all the different barriers and hurdles we encountered uh so you know after a while it was the the uh, uh the hunting lobby didn't like the idea of of contraceptives being developed for wildlife because they thought my gosh if this is successful in in geese uh, eventually they'll start using it in deer right. uh, god forbid so sure. um and in fact over time that has occurred uh, you know, there's been several innovations uh, for contraceptive use in in uh, in deer and other ungulates. I mean, they use the uh, not with nicarb with nicarb. No, 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 no. Right. Sorry, yeah. sorry, not with nicarb. I got off track. Right. It's it's okay. not with nicarb. You're just talking it's, about the concept of the concept control. of right. of. Of trying to manage a, a right. population with contraception as opposed to uh, conventional methods, right. um, but yeah, nicarb is an only effect. <laughs> we've exhaustively tested it. It only affects stuff with feathers that lays eggs. So <laughs> unless you have feathers and lay eggs, this stuff is not having any effect, contraceptive or otherwise. Right. So right. Okay. To mammals. Uh, I mean, rats can get fat on it, but they're not going to be contraceptive. So your uh, product, so somehow your company was able to figure out how to formulate this product to give the geese and and ultimately pigeons enough a dose to interfere with their fertility. There you go. Perfect. Okay. So was that the, now does it only work on the female side? It doesn't work on the male side, right? That's correct. It's it, just a female it, side. Yeah. It, okay. It, the, the science behind this is that just like in mammals on the uh, coating of the egg, uh, there's a ZP3 protein uh, okay. sperm receptor. Yeah. And that's where nicarbazin or actually a piece of nicarbazin has its effect in binding that or 
damaging that in such a way that the sperm can no longer attach to the egg. Ah, okay. So it's a, that's right. where that's where it's working. The, you know, for the for the technical explanation, it says as with so many of these things, contraceptives for wildlife. So it's a true contraceptive. It doesn't allow the fertilization of the egg, period. So it's not even an abortion. It's not even an abortion. No, there's no, if you, if you take a bunch of pigeons and treat them with oval control and, and uh, pull out one of the eggs a week later, uh, you can open it up and it looks like a a chicken egg. Let you buy at the grocery store. So there's no embryo in there. Nothing's developing. There has been no fertilization. So how much, does a does a pigeon or a female pigeon in this case? How much does she have to eat before she loses her fertility? All right, so, so it's a yeah, it's a it's it's relatively straightforward. The metric is a pound per eighty birds per day, uh, or five grams per bird. You're right. talking a half a kilo of oval control for a hundred pigeons. Okay. We are we we try to. Uh, express that to 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 customers and users is just keep that metric a pound per 80 birds uh per day and that during the breeding season so in montana for example uh you can probably take the winter off because no pigeon in the right mind is is having a it's, yeah, we're negative nine <laughs> where i'm at today so <laughs> so, yeah, so <laughs> and how does it so in light of and i think that's important because i think there's been obviously when a, a wildlife control operator is thinking about so they have a client who has pigeon problems they they've seen the price of what it would cost maybe to do an exclusion and they're they're like that they might have gotten the sticker shock from that right. and then they of course Maybe there's political reasons why they don't want to have uh, some lethal control done. And so they're like, okay, but we still need to do something. What can we do? So they're like, okay, how do we, let's try this uh, birth control for, for pigeons. And how, how long uh, do they, how do they know, like, for example, when they're looking at the price to give that person for a year, how do they know when the pigeons are are raising young in that particular <laughs> in, environment? I would assume in the southern states it's year round, but how do we find that tipping point for those of us in the northern tier of the in country? A, in the northern tier, you can certainly take the coldest winter months off. Yeah. There is, as you know, there is seasonality in pigeon breeding, okay. uh, especially in the colder climates. Uh, they need warmth to breed. Uh, so, and that's, one of the reasons why they just love power plants and and uh, gasification facilities and and uh, uh, do you have an idea of what that temperature might be that sort of minimum temperature they would need ambient to to breed you know in the seventies I no it doesn't have to be that high you're okay. going to have you know the temperature is going to fluctuate during the day I think right. the minimum. Uh, uh, or as far as low as you can go and still hope to have a pigeon egg hatch is probably around freezing. From freezing, if it's, okay. If it's going below freezing, unless, I mean, there's there's caveats to this, Stephen. You right, know, right. I've been in Minneapolis in February and found uh, nests with eggs in them. You know, well, invariably they're located under a heating duct in a right. Hospital, okay. Yeah. So if there's though there's an exogenous source of of heat for that of particular, heat. Yeah. so that's throwing it off. But uh, for for I mean, most of the jobs that I've looked at, not that I've looked at that many, there what there there might have been heat from the building because they were out, they were against the building, but there was no heater underneath it or a light that was providing a source of heat and you know it was almost as cold next to the building as it was out oh away yeah from no that. you got it and pigeons pigeons for the most part they're going to nest inside they want the protection of uh a roof some sort of cover right. on them so they have protection from the elements and from predators uh, uh that are gonna gonna want to get in there um, so they do like, and, and gosh, so many of our customers are heat producing industrial facilities. So oh, okay. All think, right. think glass, paper, pulp, uh, forging, you know, um, mills, steel, et cetera, et cetera. 
I mean, they're warm all year round. So if if you're making as a as a pest or wildlife controller, if you're making this assessment, uh, sure. In the example that you used early on about you know a, a, a small community in Montana, uh, yeah, you can take three months of the year off, yeah. no problem. Uh, if, however, you have a power plant uh, in that location uh, where it's nice and warm in certain areas of the plant, you know they're going to be they're going to be breeding, um, and that you know the the cost, you know let's. Say, for example, that there's 50% less breeding uh, in in December than there is in June, mm. all right, for a period of three months. You know, don't complicate things. Don't complicate the life of the pest controller or the wildlife controller and have him adjusting his, his, his baiting to accommodate that. Yeah. Again, it depends on the customer. If you're in a plant environment where you have – obvious heat sources, I would keep the thing going all year long. If sure. you're in in a urban area, if you're in even a, a place like, uh, what's a good example up in Montana? Um, well, Billings. 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 I, it's our biggest city. If, if, you're, if you're out there treating the city of Billings, uh, yeah, I would take three months off. I would just say, well, during that, we're going to save ourselves the money of the bait. Uh, during the winter time, because most of your pigeons are not breeding. So, would you continue to feed them untreated grain to keep them I, yes. attached to that Very, particular that's, site? That's an excellent question, and the answer is yes. Okay. Uh, you know, you condition them to that feeder. So, the right. feeder, the automatic feeder that dispenses ovo control, it's a you know, it's a reconfigured deer feeder. Mm. Uh, works exactly the same way uh and if you've if you've never used one uh it'll take you about five minutes to learn how uh, okay. but you put that for deer you put it out in the woods and you feed them twice a day uh mm -hmm. for pigeons you put it we like going on urban rooftops but it doesn't necessarily have to go on a rooftop you know any kind of flat paved concrete surface will suffice um but yeah, I'd like to keep them going in the winter. You dial them way back, uh, Stephen. So if 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 I'm normally feeding, pick an easy number, a pound a day yeah. uh, of oval control, I dial it back to a quarter pound a day uh, uh, oh. of just cracked corn, okay. or even even whole corn if you uh, if you prefer. Either way, and the idea is just to keep the the pigeons condition to coming to that restaurant every day every morning same time of day they're supposed to show up for a free meal right right i mean it's like feeding the homeless uh if they know there's going to be a meal at four o'clock that's when they show up and they'll show up and so the so right i've Congratulations. I understand you got your product as a general use product now, so it's no oh, longer yeah. restricted use. Oh, it's, so, it hasn't been restricted use for more than 10 years. Yeah. So I, I was a little surprised when I when I saw that. I was like, oh, it's general general use now, because originally when it came yeah. out, it was restricted use. Right. So in terms of, so let's talk about some of the, let's get down into the nitty gritty. So a, a, a wildlife control operator, pest control operator has a client who wants to explore this particular, so the ideal situation is of course the person has pigeons coming to their facility and so what does the the, the pest controller who has who is licensed to use this product because usually you have to have a license to use a product on someone else's property just throwing make sure you follow the rules folks just throwing it out make contact your department of ag and get your licenses or whatever but of course those of you who have your own property uh, the rules are different, but we're, for, we're talking primarily to commercial folks. So they're looking, they would want ideally uh, an off the ground location to install the automatic feeder. And uh, and then they would add, need to estimate how many pigeons would be there. They'd probably visit a few days, take pictures and try to how many pigeons are visiting the site. And then know that a pound a day takes care of 80 pigeons. All right. And and so uh, and like and, like with everything steve you got to do a site evaluation yeah you got to so, figure out and 
when customers call me out of the blue and, and say, well, we got a pigeon problem, we want to use over control. One of my first questions is, well, how many pigeons do you have? Because it's a bait and yeah. you got to feed it at a certain rate. And of course, nobody knows. They right. uh, first thing they say is, well, I have no idea. So, you know, you got to start asking some questions or during the site visit, you know, do your own evaluation. You know, how many pigeons are we dealing with? Uh, do we have 50 or 500? How do you oh. recommend that process to go? Do you recommend that they show up a couple times during the day to see different yeah, you can. practices or is there you know, a particular can, time you think is you best? Can. I, I I like mornings when the birds are still there. Okay. Uh, that being said, I, I think it's important, again, depending on the nature of your customer, uh, that you start talking with them uh, to try to figure out together uh, how many pigeons are we dealing with? You know, are there 50 or are there 500? Uh, let's try to figure this out because Ovo control um, is, you know, it, it has this dosing metric of or application metric of a pound per 80 birds per day. You're going to do it too light uh, and it's not going to work as well. Right. Do it too heavy and you're not going to hurt any birds, but you're just, you're just wasting costly wasting bait. Uh, so try to get a fix. And it, Stephen, it doesn't have to be, certainly doesn't have to be exact. Right, right. Uh, but if you got if you have 200 birds you don't want to be dosing for 100 right, right. i guess is my point point. and how do you how do you recommend that count be done so would you suggest taking some photos and then hey, being able to go back and count you know as you get trail as camera you, and yeah as you get experience at it you can start looking at flocks and making a pretty good educated guess but in the okay. meantime Take some pictures with your cell phone. You don't need a you don't need a trail cam uh, at this point. Take some pictures, different areas. Walk it. Talk to the customer. Where does he see the birds? How often does he see, do we are we seeing birds every day? Are they coming at particular times of the day? Are they nesting there? Is a real basic question. Uh, are the birds nesting there, or are we at a, a, a at a McDonald's site? Uh, where the birds are coming in daily to to sit and loaf on the roof in the sun. Yeah. Uh, so, it, you know, so much of it. And when you do those site evaluations is also when you're going to consider what tools are you going to use? You know, for the McDonald's where you got 100 birds congregating once a day to get some sun, over control, not the right choice. You know, that's just, you need a repellent that's going to work for you as opposed to a, an abatement tool. I mean, the manager of the McDonald's, of course, says, I want all the birds gone. Well, every customer wants the birds right. gone today. <laughs> Let's get rid of everything. Right, right. Where's right. Your, where is your magic wand, by the way? Sure. Um, just... But over control, <laughs> just, over control is just another tool. Yeah. Um, that you, it's an abatement tool. All right. So, if you are at a site with too many pigeons and you need to abate the population, you basically have two choices. Uh, you can kill more or you can stop them from reproducing. Right. Uh, so you kill more by trap, shoot, poison. The, the conventional methods of, of taking out uh, uh, pigeons. You know, unfortunately, those, those methods, unless you are doing them all the time, it's going to be a short-term effect. Mm. You need a unique set of conditions to be able to trap out enough pigeons to really make a long-term difference. You know, can you get them all? Mm. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, it would hard. be tough. It's tough. Typically, the, the rule that I was taught was 90% if you're trapping, you can that's kind of the goal. You should be able to get ninety percent, but the hundred percent, pretty. I'm sure some guys do it, but it's, that, that's a bit hard. That last ten percent, you know, especially if you're talking about larger pigeon populations. Yeah, I mean, I've I've had calls from customers um, that have you know the recent one from a paper manufacturer up on the Lake Michigan somewhere and. 
He said, yeah, we, we, we uh, did a census of the pigeons in our warehouse at the beginning of the summer. And there were 50 pigeons. And then we trapped all summer long and did a census again in September. And we had 100 pigeons in September. I said, well, how many did you trap? Well, we trapped 350. Oh, my gosh. So, and that that's not that's not an anomaly. I, you know, I've heard that story from many that's amazing. people. So that brings me to the next question, and that is uh, – Clients, of course, are going to be afraid of if you're starting to feed, is that going to just simply cause more birds to visit the site, therefore increasing their the cost of the need you need more product because of the luring effect of the birds? In your experience, is, is, does that how big of a fear, how, how big of a reality? Obviously, the fear is there, whether it's real or not. But how yeah, how much of a reality get, is that a problem get, for clients? We get some customers that that you know will say, "Oh my gosh, you know you." And it, a lot depends, Stephen, where you are. Okay. It, it, if I'm in downtown New York and I start, I put up a feeder at one building. You and I both know you're going to attract every pigeon from the neighborhood. Yeah. yeah. So, but pigeons are. Um, Flocking birds, a flock represents a social unit. They like to, you know, they like to go to their favorite feeding places uh, all together. Um, and we use that behavior. You, know, you set up a feeder, what I described before, of attracting the birds in first with pre-bait and then, you know, wean them off the pre-bait and transition over to over control. Um, if you're at one of our typical commercial sites where over control would be deployed the, you know it and it's because of the feeder the automatic feeder puts out a predetermined uh dose of over control so it's not like uh when you use a bait pan and you put uh, a pre-bait in it i mean the whole concept is to attract as many birds as possible right that's not our that's not our baiting protocol. So we have a flock of 80 birds. We're going to put down a pound of bait. Put down 2 pounds of bait and the 80 birds don't eat the bait, then you have the risk of attracting more birds in. Right. So okay. don't put down more than you need. I mean human nature being what it is, I mean, we all want to use if it says more. use two, two tablespoons yeah. Yeah. We got to use four because it's twice as good. It, it's it's really uh, critical with over control not to put it on too heavy. Just you know, try to get that in the zone uh, where you're not over or underfeeding, and you're not so going to you're not yeah, going to. So you're pointing out the, the importance of that initial that those initial days of inspection. You want to get a good handle on the number of birds arriving, and so therefore by targeting the volume of your bait to those birds, you don't have residue being another attractant for when those birds leave. Now other birds are going to be checking that out because yeah, you're only treating the birds that are, that are there. You know, the, the initial site of evaluation or the first couple of times you go there, you're trying to get a feel for the number of birds they got. Right. And uh, I don't want to overemphasize that or I don't want to underemphasize it either. Yeah. But you are going to determine exactly how many birds you got only after you put out a feeder. Yeah. Each feeder will accommodate roughly 150 birds. Once you have the birds conditioned to come into that feeder and you know they're conditioned, Stephen, if, if the feeder is supposed to trigger at 6 a.m., quarter to six, the birds are, birds are showing up. <laughs> flying around waiting to be fed. Yeah, it's, no, right. it's no different with deer. They show up at the deer feeder, you know, a half an hour before the thing triggers. Yeah, they so, figure it out. Um, yeah. Once they're conditioned and once they're hitting that feeder regularly, now either take a picture with your cell phone or use the trail camera and capture the image. And you take the image back to your computer. You, you know, you print one out, you count heads. Now you got to pretty act and it's it's the same birds that show up at that feeder every day right 
And if you don't, if you don't believe that, just trap a few and band them, and let them go again. You'll see the banded birds coming back. See the banded birds. How how long of a time does the what's like the mortality rate of birds? So when should the client be start beginning to see a decline in the numbers? The numbers. You, we typically get reports uh, from users and customers that they're seeing something visually within about three months. All yes. right. So pigeons, pigeons breed like crazy. Okay. So it's, it's two eggs per clutch up to six times a year, not in Montana, but uh, you know, certainly in Arizona. So they're right. prolific breeders. The good news is they got a short lifespan. So you're looking at a bird that, that that actually fledges you know and goes into reproduction two to three years um so you know i i have customers ask us all the time so, so we have to wait five years till we see any effect no it goes down over time it doesn't happen one day to the next right it's in a, it's just natural attrition you're waiting for the 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 adult birds the adolescent birds to grow up and die and pigeons don't live long I'll, I'll have people tell me well i had a pigeon that lived 15 years that's certainly possible i read in the literature a report of a pigeon that's lived 30 years but those are anomalies and uh they're not living in a great outdoors uh, <laughs> right. feral, someone's caring for that bird right feral <laughs> cats are the same way uh I mean, feral cat yeah. lives two or three years. Yeah. Uh, a house cat that gets proper nutrition, veterinary care, vaccines, and you know all the rest can live twenty years. Right. So yeah, pigeons are living too. So it's a short lifespan, and I'm certain in that population where I'm saying there's two to three year lifespan, there's probably ones in there that are living five. Uh, okay, there's also ones in there that only live six months. And the 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 predation on those populations is also high. Uh, you know, all of our raptors, uh, I mean, it's a prey species. So the raptors are taking them out uh, constantly. I think, uh, you know, they provide a nice meal for an owl. Um, and I should add uh, that there's, if you get the question about secondary effects, Sure. Because talk about that. There, there are none. You can just say uh, nine, uh, no, no secondary effects whatsoever. Either uh, uh, raptors or, or scavenger predators or scavengers. Either one. They just can't eat enough. Uh, can't eat. It's just too small. The the birds metabolizing too much of it. What about the crop? Does any of it stay? Uh, Untreat, uh, treated grain in the crop. Oh, the bird, uh, pigeons don't have a crop, do they? Yeah, so, they, yeah they do. Of course they do. They, yeah. Okay. And so, and, is it and, possible and there could right. be some? I, I remember having this question uh, at a at a meeting with New York uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, okay. and um, you know the lady said, "Well, you know the pigeon could have some of this over control in their crop, and then the peregrine falcon swoops down and eats the pigeon." Right. And not only does the falcon eat the good parts, you know, the 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 organs and the breast breast tissue, but they 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 empty the crop out as well. OK, well, it, it, now the the falcon has gotten received a partial dose of oval control. Right. So we said that pigeon, theoretically, it's a five gram dose. It's not enough to contracept the falcon. Yeah. Falcon weighs a kilo, kilo and a half. Uh and they, not only that, uh, Stephen, but you got to do it every day. Right. So each day the pigeon would have to be harvested by the falcon at the same time of day, you know, in one day after the other, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, it's not a yeah, I mean, could it happen? Sure. Yeah. Uh, is it likely to happen? Probably not in a million years. So, yeah. 
So no no danger to dogs, uh, no, cats, no. and anything. So the no mammals mouse. are even harder to harder to treat with it. Because right. of course we've probably consumed some ourselves as residue inside of the Chicken. chickens and what have you. So um that's so that's amazing. So let's talk about some strategies. So how would you recommend uh, a wildlife control operator, the pest control operator? How would they what how what would be some things they would say to some objections that you've heard? How would they respond on the sales side to client questions, client objections, if we can use that term? What are some things that would help them become comfortable with it? Like, yeah, you know, I need to use a a contraceptive. They like the idea, but they're nervous, right? So how do we how do you help that pest wow. control operator <laughs> of close course. the sale? First thing for the WCO uh, and less so for the PCO is that you need a pesticide license. Right. We're going to, so, everyone got that. You got to have your license. All right. Okay. So you're, you're, you're licensed then to use a pesticide. And I believe most states have that requirement. That yeah. I think all pest, of them do. Yep. Pest control for hire. You're going to use mm-hmm. pesticide. You got to have a pesticide license. Okay. That's clear. I, and I know that's a big hurdle for many of the wildlife control people. More are starting to listen and starting to get that license. Uh, I hear, I hear that as well. It's, it is. There's a lot more commingling between the two branches. So, Agreed. Uh, Agreed. but you're right. For some states, it is harder than others, to be sure. Right. So, um, objections and objection handling. Uh, you know, I would say that the biggest thing with ovo control is that there's the there's nothing immediate. And there's nothing tangible. Mm. So how do I know it's working if I can't count any corpses? You know, if I don't have any dead pigeons to pick up, can't possibly be working. And it's 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 so in that respect, it's almost like life insurance. <laughs> you know, it, it's okay. Insane. Yeah. So, you know, I'll ha- you know, customers will be cautious they'll be you know they don't want to believe that a that a contraceptive can do the job they want something more potent i mean i look at the people that are that are working with rodent contraceptives now uh, as opposed to rodenticides for rats gosh that is a much harder hill to climb uh i mean everybody hates rats yeah, but it's becoming. It's. I think they're starting to get some traction. Yeah, with, yes. They're doing some. Uh, they're doing some things where they're mixing both rodenticides and yeah. the and and the yeah. oval in their uh, contraceptive, and that's where. What I you know what what about the suggestion for someone who wants that sort of immediate gratification of reduction? Yeah, where I mean, the it's wildlife. Not- control operator says even, well why don't we do some trapping if, first and then we yeah. can follow up with the oval control absolutely it, i mean yeah. uh it, again going back to my basic equation of uh, uh um, control strategies you know you either get it if you're not going to exclude right right if you can't physically exclude the birds and that's uh, that's one of the first questions you got to ask yourself yeah. at any site you know can i exclude the birds here in a cost effective way yeah and sometimes you can't and it's and, just too expensive you know the people in the in the um uh exclusion business will tell you you know we can exclude anything well it's true uh but can that's, you do it you know without the guy falling over with a stroke <laughs> When he hears the price tag, so yeah, it could be pretty pricey at times, to be sure. Oh, so yeah, you, ha- you have to look at that. Um, our our technology will not drive the pigeon population to zero. Hmm. So it's another question. You know, if, if you have a customer that has a requirement, you know, for zero pigeons in a certain area, your your uh, selection of tools is even more limited. Right. Oval right. control will drive the population down to five to ten percent of its starting point. So you right. got a hundred pigeons after a few seasons, depending on environmental conditions and a lot of other factors, you'll have five or ten. And you gotta keep you, you, you should keep dosing, applying oval control in a small way continuously. You know, don't 
it, we've had so many customers quit on us. You know, somebody new comes in yeah. to management. Warehouse manager comes up. What are we doing this for? Get rid of this stuff. <laughs> so they stop doing it. And 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 a year or two later, yep. we get another phone call. Can you send us some more bags of <laughs> <laughs> control? Because we got the pigeons. We got, I mean, it it, it it's like taking the rat out of the Chinese restaurant and then yeah. you get fired because you got rid of all the rats. Got rid of all the rats. But what yeah. you asked before about combining strategies, you're absolutely correct. Right. You can combine the best of both worlds. We always recommend, uh, you know, for depends on your customer again. Customers jumping up and down. He wants to he wants to see something tangible by next week. Well, you got to trap trap out whatever you can trap out, but simultaneously for the longer term and to keep them from coming back so fast. Yeah. Uh, you know, recommend an over control program and start that thing up so that they aren't bouncing right back. I'll get companies that do a lot of trapping and they say, well, you know, we keep getting paid by trapping pigeons. I said, okay. You know, but you can get paid the same thing for right. contracepting them. With a lot less work because the automatic feeder is doing the work for you. <laughs> for a ton, a yeah. ton less money. Yeah. I, I frankly, talking to uh, pest controllers and what they spend on trapping programs, it's just remarkable that you can charge enough yeah, to recover your cost. It's such a labor intensive because just the travel to and from, if you're checking daily, uh, you know, and some well, states either, are a little bit more liberal know, than others. There, but... are, there are precious few that will check daily. You know, they'll get the customer to go up and check yeah. the, the traps and then call them if there's something in it. Uh, but, you know, trapping has its own, especially pigeons, that its own set of problems. Sure. Uh, you got people that'll tamper with the traps. You got uh, predators that'll sneak into a trap for a good meal. Uh, yes, that certainly you, happens. You, yeah, you, got, you got the, you know, we all think that's fun, but until you have to take a hawk out and, yeah. and ensure that it doesn't get hurt. Right. Uh, yeah. so, you know, and then there's the labor intensive nature of it, um, the trap checks, the trucks, the technicians. The, now, now you got the pigeons. You got to get, take them to the dump. Uh, blah blah blah. So, yeah. You know, and to me, I'd does ovo does ovo control work in any other species? I mean, we had Canada geese, but that product's no longer available now, right? right. And so it's for you have ovo control P, which is for pigeons. Yeah, it, have you dropped it, the P now? No, it's ovo. No. The product is ovo control P. P. It, and it had it has a long list of of pest birds on the label. Okay, uh, so it's worth so it's more. Can you list some of those other species? Well, Just it's all the it's all the pest the common pest species: the blackbird, the mina, the the uh, um, minas, grackles, uh, grackles. Okay, uh, starlings. The only thing that's on, not on there is a house sparrow because the the bait. Particle size is just too big for too house. big. So not house sparrows, but they also you also don't get the same flocking levels with house right. sparrows as you would they, with others. Right, and they they tend to, you know, they 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 graze it the, or they they're grazers instead of gluttonous mm. eaters. You yeah. know, and the you know the biggest problem you get with a house sparrow is you get five of them in a big box store. Yeah, you know, what do you yeah. do? Yeah, uh, you got to get them out, but ovo control is not the not the solution it's, for that. It's not the right tool for. So I mean, you know, I'll have I had an inquiry this morning for somebody that wanted to use ovo control on their pigeons that were under the solar panels, and I said that's not the right tool. You know, you you if you got solar panels and you got pigeons underneath them, you have to use wire mesh. Yeah. And surround that uh, solar array and keep the pigeons out. Right. There's no other, you know, there is no other option. Yeah. Um, I mean, people talk to me about spike strips and stuff in that kind of circumstances. I guess, but, you know, sure. where I've seen it work best is, so, you know, again, assess, evaluate your customer um we have a, a a graphic and i can send that to you Stephen, if you're interested mm -hmm. of, sure of uh, uh low medium and high opportunities you okay. know so uh um low hanging fruit 
uh, the medium stuff. So low hanging fruit would be any kind of manufacturing facility, prisons, uh, industrial facilities, power plants, oil refineries, you know, anything along those lines, big, where you would <clears throat> come to the outside and, and say, well, we're going to net this operation. And it's, it's, no, you're not. No, you're not. Yeah. Okay. So things like power plants, uh, you said, you know, oil refineries, uh, major processing type facilities, yeah. areas yeah. that are large, large scale, where you're just not going to be able to to exclude that entirely and the flocks are different places and it's just too you know it, it, the other piece of this thing i mean you can go into a web uh, amazon distribution center uh and you could net the entire uh ceiling i don't know how big they are but i know they're massive yeah yeah but you know you 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 net it and where do the pigeons go then right you know they're probably not leaving the amazon property yeah, they like it there for whatever reason. Yeah, they're not uh, they're not uh, nesting in the rafters anymore, but they're nesting somewhere else. Sure. So you you know you can you can use over control along with literally any kind of other pigeon control strategy. Right. Uh, you know, now, what they, about uh, areas if they're if the birds are feeding somewhere else and coming to your facility to loaf? Is there a way to, in someone's like, I don't want to do exclusion, I don't want trapping, they're just dedicated to do a non-lethal control method. Can you get those pigeons to start feeding? Is Have you seen that been successful, or does that just take some real time to get them conditioned it's, to stop feeding over there and to start feeding where they're loafing? Yeah, it, that that's that's a challenge, uh, okay. I would think. You know, if if I'm the customer and I have pigeons loafing at my facility you know they're just on the you know sitting on the edge of the the roof or wherever yeah. and they're just there taking in the sun um i'm looking more at a repelling strategy okay. uh, than i am at an abatement strategy so your uh, ideal situation is where they're nesting and residing for extensive periods of time yeah, or I feeding mean, or feeding pigeon, there pigeons have really powerful nest fidelity okay. so once they once they nest somewhere Stephen, you, successfully that they have a successful nest you basically have them for life they pair up uh, uh for life and a nesting pair and uh, you know one of them that loses a mate is gonna you know mm -hmm. get somebody else to hang out with but um yeah they uh, uh they're gonna be nesting there for life so once a nest is established, <laughs> you've got them. Yeah, we look for, and in, gosh, the predominant numbers of our customers, you know, we have nesting pigeons. I mean, it's one of the first questions I always ask, you know. And frankly, I don't think we get calls from people that just have loafing pigeons. Okay. Yeah, you know, they figure out they figure out some sort of dispersal a uh, solution repellent strategy to keep the pigeons from stopping there i mean it's it's like um starlings at at uh, power plants mm. you know i asked the customer well do you see them coming in seasonally oh yeah <laughs> you know once it gets cold right. the starlings yeah. come right. in to 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 warm up i said yeah. well we what you they it's not an over control candidate yeah. because they're not they're not nesting or breeding there. Yeah. It is pointless to give them over control. Give them an incentive to keep migrating. Uh, so you're going to use noise. You're going to use lights. You're going to use uh, 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 hoses. You know, mm -hmm. yep. spray them with power washers or whatever you can use to 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 annoy them enough to make them or to encourage them to move on. Okay. You were asking about the uh, uh, um, objections before, and I didn't mm. finish answering that. Uh, you know, if, if I had to guess, the biggest objection is that there's no immediate yeah. effect. Yeah. You have to wait. You know, and I, as as human beings, I'm not even say this is an American trait. <laughs> as, as, as human beings, we don't want to wait. 
right. you know, I right. want the birds gone now. Uh, well, if you want them gone now, it's either put up a net or trap, shoot, or poison. No, I can't. We can't be trapping the birds. We certainly can't be poisoning or shooting them. Uh, I mean, you can, but... Well, I mean, there might be political or sometimes some corporations have policies against that. But it's but that's an important point. So that means the wildlife control operator, the pest management professional, needs to be sure he has that, you know, come to Jesus moment with the client and realize that this is these are the limitations of the product. You have to make sure we're in this for the long haul. This isn't going to be, you know... Yeah. This. And so they need to be, and that's important because sometimes the desire to, to convert the sale gets a bad customer because you didn't properly qualify that customer. Are they really interested in, in that, you know? Yeah, you gotta, so that's important. No question. You got to set expectations. Yeah. Um, in writing, look. hopefully. So they don't forget. <laughs> 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 Memories uh, I, are fickle. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> but, you, you know, um, at companies in the United States, modern companies, you know, with 50 or more employees, yep. uh, a plant site, uh, they're going to have a big sign at the door, no guns. Right. So, um, you know, I've talked to the people at ADM, for example, uh and and they said well we have wildlife services come in and shoot them over the weekend i said well how's that working well it doesn't you know because they can only shoot a, a small portion of the population right. and the others just breed right, right back again or yeah or they fly yeah they fly away you're able to kill some and then they'll, they'll fly back in and so yeah it's uh certainly bird control so this is an important uh we have another tool in the toolbox and so we want to make sure that the wildlife control operators pest management professionals one of the one of my pet peeves is it's important for us not to say no so if you have a client who says i don't want to use lethal control well uh, for the right situation, this is an option for yeah. them that yeah, will fulfill uh, that. Yeah, don't um, uh, don't argue with the customer. Yeah, so if this is this is important, and so the option don't say no. Here's an option. Learn more about it. Where would they? Let's give them their the URL again for where they can learn more about the product. Well, if you uh, want to read about it, it's, it's of course is www.ovocontrol.com. Ovocontrol.com. Uh, o v o control. Dot com. Dot com. It's just right. that it spells like can, it sounds. There's, you know, there's telephone numbers on there and there's, uh, uh, you know, you can message us however you prefer to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, the product gets a lot of support. Um, you know, there's there's uh, uh, instructional videos on the website. Uh, it is it is really difficult to make a mistake with oval control. Yeah. Okay, It's not like using a toxicant. You mix it up too hard or too strong and you got a whole bunch of dead birds right, uh right. if if you feed them too much you're just wasting bait uh but you're not going to hurt anything you're not going to kill a dog uh you know you're not going to have any kind of effect on a raptor or other predator uh it's just it's non-toxic you can't i mean the yeah. only way to kill a bird with with ovo control, is if you take a thirty pound bag of it and drop it on the bird, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Then the so bird's dead. Little, which is physical control. How right. about uh, the PPE? The PPE requirements for the products? It's just yeah, gloves? It's, it's just it's the standard stuff: gloves, oh, long, long sleeve long shirt. shirts. Okay. That's that's about the extent of it. And incidentally, it comes. It, there's no. It comes ready to use. Right. Uh, so no mixing. It, there's no mixing required. You pour that, the, the feeder will hold probably 150 pounds of ovo control. Most people don't put anywhere near that much in it. You know, they they are using uh, a bag or two at a time, um, pour it in the feeder. So that would, that would automatically feed. So let's just do a scenario here. So if there's 150 pounds in it and you have 80 birds, so that could go for 150 days yeah a pound a day go, right you could go months have that to go way. back and quote unquote yeah check you it. know the the only we we recommend that you go and check the feeder the automatic feeder once a month once so a month like with the uh, commercial pest control 
you know, the standard uh, service interval is, is monthly. And we encourage um, yes. our pest controllers and wildlife controllers to do that, to, to service it monthly uh, and to set that up with once it's operational. Right. You got, you know, you can't just throw a feeder up and expect it to to do everything for you. We recommend it's a three, two, one program. So three visits the first month, two visits the second month, and once a month after that. So build that into your, you know, when you when you're pricing these things, your customers, I find that the uh easiest way to price them, you know, without having to do a lot of uh, arithmetic on the back of the envelope is just to use X dollars per feeder per month. Mm. Okay, Mr. Customer, you got 150 pigeons, so we're going to set up a feeder and we're going to charge you X dollars a month. Include everything. Given the simplicity, is it does it would it behoove some while some pest controllers to get their dealer's license and just simply sell it to the client and let them set it up? Or is that something, uh, how hard is it to become a dealer? You know, we, we do not have a dealer network. Maybe we okay. should, but uh, uh, I mean, if you wanted to, it, the last thing I guess we need in today's economic uh, uh, environment is to increase the distance between the manufacturer and the customer. Okay. You know, we'd rather eliminate levels of distribution as opposed to increasing them. Mm -hmm. um, if if you want to if you want to deal over control, I mean that's possible too. We can you yeah. know buy a pallet of the stuff and You're you a get you get a you get a discount, and then when you resell it, you 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 keep the discount for yourself. Sure. And how uh, how long does it last in the bag before oh, gosh. the grain? It's, uh, nicarb is in the active ingredient is remarkably stable and, and the uh, grain itself how how durable is you know you grain? don't want to you don't want to uh, and i th think the label also includes instructions to keep out of of water if you put right, this right, yeah. if you apply it to standing water Stephen, uh it, it, it's like a, a a cat food kibble Ooh. it just it'll turn to mush turn to and, yeah and so gotta dry just like all your pesticides Keep them dry. Yeah, keep them dry. Uh, storage conditions are are uh, clean and dry, free of any vermin and insects. Mm -hmm. So mice will get into, given the opportunity, mice will get into the stuff. Oh, sure. And yeah. so will rats. And it, even stored product pests will, if given the opportunity, the weevils, weevils will get, get into in the there. stuff. If, if you store it in a warehouse that's infested with weevils, uh, it'll get weevils as well okay and do you have any recommendations on the pre-bate what did you have your what's your magic food for the pre-bait yeah, that the, really gets the, them feeding the universal food we use is cracked corn cracked corn and a, you know a lot of the uh, uh a lot of the pest controllers especially will say well we use whole corn <laughs> okay yeah the reason to use the reason for whole corn is that pigeons can eat it and yes. other little songbirds can't. Yeah. We don't we don't necessarily I, I mean the incidence of non targets at one of these feeders yeah. once pigeons are conditioned to it, next to nothing. Yeah. I mean, I can count on one hand, Stephen, the number of non target reports we've had over the last ten years. That's amazing. So yeah. it 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 well, you know, for example, if you if you set up your feeder in an area uh, that has many and copious uh, competitive food sources, okay, you're probably going to attract non-targets. So if, if, if you put this stuff, if you put it up at a fish processing plant, you know, where you got seagulls and pigeons galore, well, you know, the seagulls are going to compete and probably win. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the good news is that it's it's not a toxicant. So if you if you get a mistake like that, you just stop, and the non-target birds return back to normal again within a week. Within a week, okay. So there's there's no there's no permit. It's truly a contraceptive. You stop giving it, 
And it's the same thing for pigeons. If someone decides they want their pigeons to breed again, just stop. Just stop. Yeah. They go right back to normal. It's amazing. Well, uh, anything more that we want to need to cover here that for our, our, our users that they should know about that we didn't cover in this, we covered a lot of different stuff here. Yeah. Uh, so is there anything we're missing that we want to be sure we get out there oh, before we close up today? There's probably some stuff I, I could yeah. go on for hours on this topic. Sure. Well, yeah. we want to do the 80-20 principle, yeah, right? No, so I, the 20 I that... I don't want to keep you for hours or your sure or your viewers for hours, but okay. uh, yeah, I I I think we covered the high points. Steve. All right, I think we covered them well. Well, we're making. Uh, I want to be sure that the viewer understands. We've been talking to uh, Eric Wolf of Ovo Control, and he's the he's the CEO of Inalytics LLC. But you're probably going to remember the Ovo Control easier. That's O V O Control. Dot com. You can learn more about this. This is the, the pill for pigeons you know, and, and other and birds. It's actually any, allowed for other know, birds as well. Prevents any, the reproduction. If, if you go on any search engine and just type in a little bit of uh, birth control for birds. or Birth control for of, birds. It'll come up. Or even pigeon control or just you're about out, anything. You're out there. You'll, you'll find, uh, you will find us. And we refer to it affectionately as planned pigeonhood. <laughs> okay. Planned, planned pigeonhood. You you heard it here from the CEO. That's great. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wolf. I really appreciate your time here today talking to our uh Living the Wildlife audience about uh birth control for pigeons or planned um planned uh, planned pigeon. Pin, pigeon control uh for, for pigeons. But it also is of Labeled for other birds as well, so we oh, want yeah. to be sure that's yeah, and we, uh, that's we, out there as well. Yeah, we continue to do work in in other birds. We we have some international work going on now in other birds. So yeah, well, I saw the minas. So for those of us who are those that are out in the Australian area of the world, we do have some people that listen. I uh, know of at least one listening out of Australia. So the mina birds. This is another odd. This is something minas can be quite a hassle for. Yeah, some of those Southeast in, Asian areas. So Asian, Middle East, uh, <laughs> India, parts of Africa are overwhelmed with them. Yeah, so they're quite a they're quite a bird. Well, we're really glad to have you on board. So everyone you've been listening to, of course, Eric Wolf of Ovo Control or Analytics LLC. And we've been talking about pigeon birth control and birth control for birds. And so hopefully check it out if you're doing bird work. If your clients are concerned about using lethal control for pigeons for for whatever the case may be this is a product you might want to be able to check out it's a general use product but you're going to need to have a license to use it uh, on someone else's property but at least you can become aware of another tool uh, that can be available for the management of these birds and make yourself some money and satisfy the cl client at the same time. So definitely check it out, ovocontrol.com. Well, you've been listening to Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek podcast family. Do take a few moments, if you would, to subscribe to the channel, ring the bell. If you have questions, comments, and yes, even criticisms, you can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. And again, this is Living the Wildlife. Why do we call it Living the Wildlife? Well, because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody. There you go. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it.